friends, I'm the Dungeon Tutor, but today I'm just Rob. Uh, in lieu of making a proper Dungeon Tutor video, I decided that while my voice isn't quite up to stuff, I think another conversational video might be more appropriate. And something I think that people might enjoy is a recollection <clears throat> of when I first encountered a role-playing game many of you have probably heard of, Vampire the Masquerade. Now, Vampire the Masquerade was a phenomenon. In its time, uh, lots of people heard about it. Lots of people formed opinions of it by proxy. Uh, while it did sell well, it was a very popular game. It was a cultural touch point, really, uh, as a certain underrepresented group of gamers uh, and, and social outsiders uh, kind of moved to embrace the vampire game, the weird, quirky little game uh, that many of the other gaming community just dismissed as being just kind of too out there. And it became known as the goth game. Uh, the players and enthusiasts for the game got typified and stereotyped pretty quickly. And it just wasn't cool for the more in-the-know gamers who didn't, didn't try it. I being one of those. I rolled my eyes, the idea of people running around with cloaks. And the line blurred pretty badly <clears throat> with the theater of the mind LARP vampire game that existed and the tabletop role-playing game that existed. I don't know how much overlap there actually was in terms of the Theater of the Mind group and the Vampire the Masquerade tabletop game. There's probably a significant overlap, but it certainly wasn't a perfect overlap. There were plenty of people who loved the role-playing game who had nothing to do with the uh, online game, or the live-action role-playing game. So, I went through quite a bit of time while Vampire existed. I understood that it did bring some people into the, the gaming society. I do know that there were people who hadn't really connected with other versions of role-playing that really, really liked it. But I hadn't had a chance to try it until later on in my college career. Now, my very first chance to play was by Invitation. And the nature of the invitation was kind of odd. Uh, my very first group that I had in college had one primary game master. He loved creating his own world. He loved narratively having this uh, long campaign that, that went on and on and on and on. Uh, so many dips and twists. And it was all you know meaningful. There was a lot of, a lot of really interesting elements. I really grew a lot from proximity watching him work and picking up some of his some of his tricks and adding them to my own toolbox but uh, the group that we had became some of my closest circle of friends with the exception of one person in that first group that I joined that was the brother of the dungeon master who just came off to me with my, again, very insular, very somewhat naive sensibilities. He was weird. He always had this air about him that he was endlessly amused by you. That he would put up with, uh, you know, so much of your, your garbage, but he was above it. Um, he was tall, always wore a trench coat. Long black hair, uh, kind of angular face, and not didn't talk much. But when he did, it was usually with kind of a smirk or a sneer. But when he said something insightful, it was devastatingly on point. And his words had a lot of weight. But he was kind of on the outside of the group. The rest of the group, being a regular D&D party, he was the half-orc fighter who... I believe his name was Ramal, who didn't delve, delve into the inter-party stuff, just kind of stayed on the periphery for the most part. Even though he was an important part of the group, he drifted off after that game ended. I think we were just playing a lot of D&D, &D and he didn't care for D&D &D as much. I think it was part of it. 
And I'm sure he had other things to do. We were in college, after all. Maybe he was working hard while the rest of us were playing too much. I don't know. But eventually, he invited me to play Vampire. Like I said, his kind of, again, kind of gave me creepy vibes anyhow. So when he asked if I wanted to play Vampire, I'm like, I guess I could try it. It seemed like the kind of game that this this person would run. And, you know, I'd been playing for a while. I'd played a variety of games by this point. I thought, yeah, it might be interesting. So, the I didn't hear a whole lot about the 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 premise of the game. Just knew that I would have two other people in my group of vampires called a coterie. And we would play. Okay. So, I made a character, and he said, make a person. Don't make a vampire. Make the person. And this became my mantra for, for these kind of games as well. I'm far less interested in the powers that you end up picking as I am the personality you play, which is exactly the problem that I have with 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, where it's all about the powers you get and the build that you have these days with many of my players. But in this particular case... It was make the person. And I made a person. His name was uh, John. Uh, last name really doesn't matter. I think it was Peterson. And he was, in a, he was a financial guy. He had a startup with a partner. He uh, was very good with finance. Very intelligent. Not a vampire. Just a normal guy. Uh, went out to the gym uh, twice a week. Uh, did a little uh, target shooting, uh, you know, is is kind of a, a boys' club kind of thing. Uh, like sports, was interested in the internet and technology, but not a vampire. Certainly, no combat skills outside of again, <coughs> a little boxing, sparring thing when that was trendy. He, he had a little bit of fighting. He had a little bit of shooting from his target practicing, but that was it not a vampire. So then, I, I made the character up. Even though there were these big sections on the sheet, disciplines and blood pool and stuff like that, I didn't touch any of that by direction of the, game, of the storyteller. And then, we had a one-on-one -on -one session. Those of you who've played vampire before might know about the embrace. It is the time when your character becomes an actual vampire. Now, the worst thing in my mind, if somebody is playing vampire for the first time, would be to skip this vital step. I think it would be a tragedy, honestly. Because there's nothing that puts you into the role better. So, my character would live fine. He, he actually had a ward. He had a daughter. So, wife died, still had a daughter. Uh, by the way, <laughs> many people consider this to be a mortal sin in playing Vampire the Masquerade. Never leave attachments. They will always go against you. Yeah, that, that can happen. So, uh, one late night, my partner, who had a skin allergy, couldn't go out in sunlight, <laughs> uh, eventually said, hey, you know, our business is doing great. We're, you know, you and I, we can really make it, but I got to tell you something, you know, well, I'm a vampire. Huh? Yeah, actual vampire. I drink blood to survive. I've been alive for about 30 years and haven't aged a day through it. Or I've, I've been a vampire for 30 years and haven't aged a day through it. Yeah, I can't actually endure sunlight which is this allergy I've got. But these days, with you and the business, you being the front of it, I don't have to. It's been really working pretty well. We're making money. We're doing okay. I don't have a whole lot of issues. But the thing is, you know, we've been doing pretty well together, you and I. We're friends, I think. And I thought you might be an ideal person to bring into this thing I've got going on. I'd like to make you a, into a vampire, too. And it's like, uh, wow, that's, that's a weird thing. And the fact that I did make the person first 
made that pretty significant. Do I, do I do it? Is it possible? Obviously, thinking about it, it's not really a choice. You're playing the vampire game to make a vampire, so you know your character would eventually make that choice. And I'm, I, kind of floored by this because the character has you know all these stats and everything, and we've thought about the background and all that. And it's like, well, what would I do in this situation? But it was it was the illusion of choice. Obviously, I chose. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll be a vampire. If if I talked to uh, talking to the storyteller later, he's like, if if I turned it down, uh, then it would be a couple of years later, and he'd come back and say, hey, the option is still there. You're still young. Your body hasn't started to you know feel the decline of age. You're at the perfect point right now. If you want to become a vampire, you're in the fullness of your strength, and youth is always going to be in. So you can lock yourself in right there for the rest of however long you can stay alive. So I, I said yes. He gave me some time to put my affairs in order, which I did. Uh, again, for my character, it was really easy with his grasp of finance and real world all, all the ins and outs of business and identity and, and all that. Got everything set up to the point where I didn't have to do anything during the day. All my stuff could be done at night. I worked through proxy, basically kind of stepping down, but at the same point making it very clear that I'm still calling the shots. I'm still the financial brains behind the operation. And this took uh, a few weeks. Um, also, of course, I you know, there's... Wanted to make sure that my daughter was was completely taken care of. So I had to do some things to put her in private school. Um, you know, I would be able to talk to her at night, but... Yeah, things were going to change, and when she got older, I would address that situation and possibly also make her into a vampire. This is my thought. <clears throat> so, okay, I've got things squared away as well as can be done. So... The embrace. It's at night, clearly. Nice place. And I think we were at a garden somewhere. And he described the experience of all of a sudden my friend is there, and um, all of a sudden I feel this in, this sure very very brief sharp pain in the neck, and then this incredibly blissful experience. The embrace is not painful. Vampires have this natural ability that when they actually fang you, it doesn't hurt. It's incredibly pleasurable, which is convenient. It's certainly better than the Nosferatu movie, right? Where it's pretty freaky. They have to charm their their victims before they can can feed without you know undue terror and so on. In this case, no, it's the opposite. Some people, if you if you don't kill a person by drink drinking their blood, you just take sips. Uh, they can become addicted to the kiss, which is what um, taking blood from someone is called. It's called a kiss. And the embrace is if you drain all of a person's blood so that they're going to die. And then you give them just enough vampiric blood to sustain their life. Or a bit more if you're not a jerk. Um, so they're not instantly starving. And uh, they... If, if, they, if they drink the vampiric blood, they transform. They become a vampire. <clears throat> uh, if there's spoilers here, I'm, I apologize. Uh, if anybody has never played vampire before, this was my experience, and I hope I'm not going to spoil something, because I think that first time is, can be very special. Which is why I want to share it. So, uh... So he framed every moment of it. It's like, okay, so I'm feeling myself getting tired, more and more tired, exhausted as the blood is draining my body. And then a smell. I taste something. Something is on my lips. And all of a sudden it tastes like the greatest thing I've ever had. Absolutely, my body wants more of it. At this point, I could have chosen. Do I not drink whatever is being offered to my lips? Because some people don't. Some people do not take to being vampires. But obviously I made a character to play the game Vampire, so yes, of course my character would, would drink. And it was described as absolutely pure sweetness, the, the richest thing I had ever, 
ever tasted. Uh, I just wanted more and more of it, but I got cut off. It was removed from my mouth. It turns out that he had cut his own wrist, and he was feeding me his blood, and then he sealed the wound. Vampires can seal wounds on their own body by just lick, and it's done. It's fixed. Uh, they could just spend a little bit of blood and heal, you know, some significant wounds. Yes, kitty. Hello. And now I have a kitty, which makes everything better. So he's like, okay, you're now going to turn into a vampire. You're going to need blood, and you're going to need it fairly soon. Now I'm going to teach you how to hunt. Because you're going to have to do this on your own. Every night you should hunt. Every night. So that you make sure that you're never without enough blood to keep everything going. And while we're doing that, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you the important foundations of our society. Because I'm a member of Clan Ventru. We are the rulers of Vampire Society. And by proxy, you will be put in a position of leadership, too, at some point when you're ready. But you're going to need to know the litany. You're going to need the rules of vampiric uh, society. And you're going to have to abide by them. If you don't, you'll be destroyed. You don't want that, and I don't want that. But you're smart. You will follow the rules, and you will enjoy the fruits of being on the right side of this. Because there are people who are not. And we are going to have to, at some point, have to deal with that. But for right now, you're on our side. And it's the right side to be on. So he explained the litany. In real time, by the way, he didn't just hand me some notes or anything like that. He explained it out to me. We did our, our hunt. We found, uh, I think I found an artist who was kind of panhandling. And... <laughs> I'm like, okay, hey, here's 20 bucks, buddy. And using my nascent powers of domination, I, my character fed for the first time right there. And David was right there and said, you know, don't, don't, don't too much. A little bit and you're fine. As long as you don't get too hungry, you're still you. But the thing is, blood's so good that there's a part of you that's always going to want it and want as much of it as you can get. If you let it win, it's going to make you wallow in blood no matter how you get it. Ripping out throats, stealing the entire depository of a blood bank, whatever. You need to stay in control. It's very important. Control is extremely important as one of the kindred. That's us. We are the kindred. <clears throat> So I think I, I think I ended up feeding twice that night just to, just to top off. Uh, and again, uh, I without really understanding the rules, I had taken a little bit higher generation, so my character was you know kind of powerful. But uh, I didn't know all the ins and outs. So as I my, the storyteller actually guided me through taking you know disciplines that I was going to take. Uh, soup, the, the, the extra backgrounds that I took as part of part of being a vampire, the whole package. And he's like, okay. So, you now know how this works to an extent. You know how to survive. If I vanish tomorrow, you'll be okay for a while. But now I'm going to help get you into the society. And I've got to have, I'm going to have to present you to the prince. Prince? We're, we're in America. I, what is this? This is in Chicago. We're, we're in America. We don't have princes. <laughs> no, 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 no. The kindred society, for our faction, the Camarilla, we have a prince. They rule the city. And we have one. And you're going to have to meet the prince. Everybody does. All new children. And you are my child. Which means I'm responsible for you, so you better not screw up. You're going to have to meet the prince. Prince will have to look at you. He'll acknowledge you because I had permission to make you into one of us. And then on, he can give you orders. But realistically, you'll be left to your own devices to live your, your existence how you want to. 
uh, there's a there's a lot of freedom in being one of us. I mean, technically, if you want to keep your position in mortal society, you'll still you know pay taxes. You'll still have to do things to make money for your accounts and make sure everything stays even. And you'll have to avoid anything that's going to out you as being one of us. And may, that may be faking your death. I've had to do that. You know, things like that happen. But once you get things under control, there's a lot of resources in place that you'll be fine. It'll all work out. So, my character ends the night. It's been a long night, clearly. Uh, and the last thing David said is like, okay, this is your last sunrise. Enjoy the sunrise and then go to bed. Your body will finish its process of dying. When you wake up, your heart won't be beating. If you check right now, it's it's not. Uh, your body will be cool. You will have picked up a little bit of thirst, keeping yourself a lot, uh, uh, intact. You can go out and feed. Be careful not to get caught. I mean, that's... At this point, this you know a lot of the stuff is fairly common sense to my character. Don't get caught, and I will see you early tomorrow night, and I'll take you to meet the prince. Okay. So, we do all of this. My character goes to bed. He or watches the sunrise. Again, the, 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 the storyteller describes it in excruciating detail about how the feelings inside of my character's body were changing, my vision sharper than it's ever been, all the senses, both the putrescence of the city as well as the smell of flowers or a lady's perfume who's a quarter of a block away. Uh, all of these things are just a, a kaleidoscope, almost overwhelming to the senses at this point. And the same time, he's, all of his narration is in this earnest style as he's, you know, got this just inscrutable look on his face. So he's earnestly pouring all of this detail, all of these impressions into my character's last moments. And again, it was just he and I. It was a very special moment. My first time playing this vampire game. So that was our solo session. My character went to bed and would wake up and uh, Fed resolved with just a dice roll. This, this wasn't extremely important. The extremely important thing was that David was taking me to see the prince. Just like the other two player characters, players were also having their sires take them to see the prince. We were all legitimate vampires. <coughs> so that's when the first group session started. And we go to meet the prince. If you have ever done Chicago by Night, the prince of the city at that time went by the name Ballard. Ballard was a grotesque pig of a man who actually had an advantage that he could still eat even though he was a vampire. Normally a vampire's digestive system atrophied. All they, can, all they care about is blood. They are a blood reservoir slash refinery at this point. He through dedication to eating, kept up the pretense that he could still eat. For other vampires, it would sicken you to even think about eating regular food again. It would be the sip and spit thing. Him, nom, 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 nom. And he was a large, large man. But just, you know, reveling in his power. And he was Ventrue as well, so he was so happy to see me. Uh, as a proper, upstanding, young uh, child uh, who could help to, you know, quite honestly, bring all of these ancient vampires into the modern day and help them get through, because that's one of the biggest problems vampires have. As they get older, they have a harder time connecting with the modern society. That's why a lot of the pictures you see of vampires show them in gothic garb that was fashionable when they were alive, or in some cases, maybe a time they actually acclimate, acclimated to, but as time goes on, it often passes them by, especially if they slip into torpor, which uh, we could talk about. And yes, I was told the great things were expected of me, and I would eventually do this, but at the moment, I was going to be part of a coterie. 
two other vampires who were going to uh, be my companions, and he decided they weren't going to be young Ventru. Nope, one of them was a Nosferatu. Oh, boy. So, the Nosferatu is a serial coward. I'm just going to say that. He had no combat skills. He was extremely good, extremely good at obfuscation. Which, in vampire terms, means he can't be seen unless he wants to be seen, or you're more powerful than he is. Fair. I was not more powerful than he is, so most of the time, the only time I knew he was around was that a particular stench occurred. He smelled terrible, which is a common trend among the Nosferatu. Many of them do smell bad. Not just because oftentimes they are relegated to living in sewers. They just naturally smell bad. Um... They also usually look deformed and hideous, and he was. I believe he had fangs that kind of sprouted out the sides of his, his mouth. But the one thing I remember, always uh, with certain people, they liked to juxtapose the horrible with something about them that is reserved from their old life. Uh, oftentimes. I can't remember what my, what my coterie uh, partner had, because I never really got to see him. He was always obfuscating. Uh, if I remember right, though, he had wavy, luxur luxurious hair. His hair hadn't changed. It was still very nice. But the rest of him, I think he had, like, yellow veins crisscrossing his skin and was really wrinkly and leathery and just kind of gruesome. <clears throat> the other person in the group, I believe, was Gangrel. They are the kind of the lone wolves, uh, lone wolves of... Uh, the Camarilla, and he was kind of there just to round us out more than anything. Again, didn't spend a lot of time with the rest of us. And uh, so we were told that we would eventually have tasks that would be assigned to us from the prince when he needed a trio of vampires to go and take care of something. So we had a couple of introductory adventures where I learned that, man, Dominate is amazing. It is the greatest power when you're dealing with people. Because no matter what, if mortals were going to get involved, bam. Hi, how's it going? You aren't going to remember any of this. Now, why don't you just go run along and let us do what we're doing, and you'll be fine. I frequently spent blood just to give myself a, a, a blush of life so I didn't wasn't doing the pasty, pasty pale thing all the time. And uh, I think my character had, well, definitely dominant, dominate. Uh, what was the other ability? I, I had some fortitude, so I could, I could be difficult to defeat. Uh, I was fairly tough, but not superlatively so. And this game didn't last very long, so... Uh, we, we got through a couple things. We had, we had a fight. Clearly learned. Bullets can hurt vampires, but they're not the best way to stop them. And at the end of every session, the game master would ask, what did you learn? And we would say, hey, you know, I learned that, you know, human minds are weak and fragile, and if I use my dominate, there aren't going to be a lot of mortals that are going to be able to stand in my way if I can get into a situation where the bullets aren't flying immediately. And that got you character points. So you, we were improving our characters as we went. <clears throat> now what I did not know until later, and, and I did learn this while we were playing, but the Game Master was running two separate games at the same time. Our little group were the Camarilla faction. He was also running some Sabat. And the Sabbat were also operating in Chicago. They were going to interlace. This was the idea the, game, the storyteller had from the beginning. <laughs> and the people who made the Sabbat made the sickest combat characters they could. Just out-and-out -out murderers. Uh, all of them with the, the, the right blend of combat powers to make them both awesome in terms of fighting ability and absolutely depraved. Uh, they had a uh, Zemitsi. If, you, if you're familiar with uh, Vampire the Masquerade, Zemitsi have a couple of 
interesting traits, but the one thing they're mostly known for is they can fleshcraft. They can actually change people's bodies permanently. They would be the perfect, uh, absolutely perfect plastic surgeons without using a stitch of plastic, without needing anesthesia or anything. They can mold bodies to the way they want. And, uh, and, and if you do that to a vampire, <laughs> They can they can actually make lasting changes, which is hard for vampires because their bodies constantly knit themselves back as they spend blood to survive. So, uh, elder Tamitsi oftentimes will use their bodies as weapons. They will have long claws, or they might have long bone spurs that they can use as weaponry, and they can be pretty dang effective and nasty. And this particular one also had a particularly dark trend. He could only exist on the blood of corpses who were in themselves infected with diseases. He was a carrier of every known disease. Ebola, AIDS, uh, you know, tuberculosis, everything. He had that in him. Which meant that anybody he fed from, even a little sippy sip, could mean they're going to get very, very, very sick and die. So, uh, the others were also combat monsters. I, I, I just remember the Tamizu particularly, because he was a vicious uh, character with no redeeming qualities. And in the end, if I remember right, the rest of his coterie actually sold him out. He was even too sick for them. Uh, sold him out to the Camarilla, if I remember right. But, one of the things they did was they were looking at some of the new Camarilla, who were not really powerful, not really connected, but influential. And as my character was a new money man for the Camarilla, they were interested in my character. So a little bit of research, a little bit of work, because my character still had a, a public identity. They found out that I had a daughter, and they went to her school and got her. What's going to stop three combat-oriented vampires from just going in and and grabbing some girl out of school. They didn't even really need to cover it up, but I think they kept it pretty much on the down low. So they contacted my character, which in a time of cell phones and stuff, is pretty darn easy to do. And they contacted me. I don't remember how it actually happened, but they said, all right, we have your daughter. Meet us at this point. And we'll talk about how you can get her back. And at this point, I talked to David, and he's like, I believe his advice was, you're pretty much going to have to write her off because these guys are psychotic killers. I mean, there's no good way out for you if you go to see them. Uh, you don't have the skills, you don't have the strength, and quite honestly, they can kill her like that before you can do anything you would have to call in a major crew to come in and take over that situation. And realistically, they probably also have backup too. So uh, your daughter's probably as good as dead at this point. But then I thought to myself, okay, if I can't save her, I can't leave her in their clutches. I have to get her out of that situation. So it was no small thing that my character went out and he got a gun. A pistol. Small pistol. So he got this gun. Not to defend himself, because he knew bullets, while they can hurt, aren't going to stop a vampire. And I didn't go into anything like, you know, uh, incendiary ammunition or anything like that. Honestly, we just didn't advance to the, the level where we were treating everything like a military tactical campaign, like some vampire games can get into. I just bought pistol, hollow point rounds. Okay, good to go. And I contacted my coterie, and uh, the Nosferatu watched. Didn't do anything, he just watched, because realistically, what was he going to do against three combat monster Sabat, plus any backup they had? We met in a diner. Uh, there was just the staff. Nobody else was there. And none of the staff was in a position to worry about us. We'll just put it that way. 
So, uh, my character is like, let me see her. Let me, let me know that she's safe. Otherwise, we have no business talking, and I'll just leave. And they're like, you're not leaving, buddy boy. But hey, we brought your daughter anyhow, so you can see her. And uh, combat in, in, in vampires is, is kind, of, kind of odd. Uh, it, it's in one place straightforward, but it's also quite abstract. So I'm like, okay. And they, as soon as they brought her out, and I was looking at her and looking at the situation, they thought I was being a little too analytical. And they started the combat, because, quite honestly, they could beat my character up to all ends. Didn't matter. I'm a vampire. They knew how to really kill me if they wanted to, but they didn't really want to. So they acted before I could even draw my gun out of its holster. And, again, I did say that they were very combat-oriented. So even though my character had some toughness, wasn't a complete pushover, there was a, just, like, a single round. My character was down. Nobody came to my rescue. David watched, but then he realized the stakes were a bit higher. And even though it didn't make him happy, I, my character got taken by the, the Sabbat. Uh, we went to a fade to black scenario there. Uh, my character, they didn't, they didn't say if my character got diablerized, which is uh, brought to final death by drinking all of their blood and their essence, which vampires can do. Uh, it can make them stronger if the person is of a, uh, a more potent blood, and mine was more potent than one or two of their characters, so they might have just passed me off to, to strengthen one of them. It's possible. <laughs> they might have tried to convert my character, considering I really wasn't a huge fan of Ballard. That isn't still isn't likely, because my character was pretty opposed to the chaos that the Sabbat would represent. But if they had managed to, you know, make it clear that my daughter would not be harmed, somehow we could get out of that, I might have really thought about it. But we never got to that part. It was always, okay, we know the Sabbat wins this. This experiment is over. This storyline is done. Um, I believe that uh, that Samitsi got handed over to the Camarilla for something. No, I take it back. Uh, that was from a different game. Never mind that. That was from a different, a totally different game we were playing. That game we were playing werewolves against vampires, and the vampire crew was also pretty dark. The, the ones that I, that I faced were, were still way too tough for me, though. And so I, I lost my very first character. I don't know if he died. Probably did, honestly. The Sabbat are all about that diablerie when they can get away with it. And there was nothing that would stop them from doing it. They probably also did horrible things to the, to the daughter. They might not have embraced her, but they might have embraced her into one of their uh, groups and brought her along into their society. I don't know. I simply don't. But I don't question it that much because it was kind of a snapshot. It was an experiment for him. For me, it was my very first time playing vampire. And honestly, it was damn gripping. It was the most involved I had gotten into a character. Honestly, D&D kind of leaves you at an arm's distance in most games. Your character still is a character that you are moving around as your avatar. There may be some immersion that you get, but at the time, we weren't really going for the immersion quite as much. This was very immersive. And while my character never even had a chance to go to the Beast and... Uh, and in frenzy, that didn't happen. I didn't have a bloodbath snap moment because my character was brought up kind of right. He was brought up understanding how things worked and never let himself get into a position where he was too thirsty for blood. The situation probably would have caused him to frenzy in the fight against the Sabbat had he had a chance to. But it was personal. It was... I was shaking by the time I bought the gun and thinking about, oh, I'm going to have to, I'm, for her sake, I'm going to have to kill her before they have a chance to do anything terrible to her. Um, and then in, the, in a worst case scenario, somehow I could get her out if they're careless or I see the opportunity, I could try to get her out. And 
that's going to create all kinds of problems too, but it's worth doing. And at least I'll have, I'll have a gun, so I'll have a little bit of an edge, possibly. Yeah, they had bigger guns. So when it was all over with, again, I was just shaking. I was overwrought with emotion. Uh, the game master basically heightened the experience the entire time, the, the storyteller, by you know, constantly talking about the feeling of the moment, the, the details that come to mind, how the, the mind kind of sees some things and they're frozen in the memory forever after because just of where you are and what's hitting you at the moment. And that, even though that's 30 years ago, and a lot's happened in my life since then, I can still remember elements of that game to this day. It was one of the most memorable role-playing experiences I've ever had. There's a reason why some people really, really love Vampire the Masquerade, and I have an incredible amount of respect for it. One of the best campaigns I've ever ran was a Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle. And I'll talk about that in another conversation at some point. But I hope you kind of enjoyed this uh, one part testimonial to how good this game was, and another part a kind of a dissection of the experience and, and, and really how to run an incredibly memorable game. It always felt different from other role-playing games, and it remains different from any other role-playing game I've ever played. So, that's my story, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I am Rob, sometimes the Dungeon Tutor, and this was my recollections of my very first time playing Vampire the Masquerade. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you for coming and everything like that. I'd also like to thank Dan. If he ever sees this video, was the storyteller for the game. He was a, a heck of a guy, um, and I, 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 I wish I'd have gotten to know him better, because I knew that m I found out that most of the impressions that I had of him um, were, were were kind of false impressions. He put a wall around himself that it made him intimidating to to approach. But playing alongside of him and playing with him as the storyteller, he's honestly one of the greatest storytellers of, of Vampire I've ever heard of. And he made that moment incredibly special so that I can only hope that I've done a shred of justice to the experience for the players that I have guided through into playing the World of Darkness games. I certainly hope so. But that was how, uh, you know, a kind of measure of my, my innocence was broken. So I owe that all. A large part of that to Dan. Uh, I kind of wish my side had done a little bit better, but eh, that's how it goes sometimes. But uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you liked it. I'll keep doing these videos too from time to time, but the vampire story was pretty special, and uh, I really wanted to make sure that people heard my story so I never forget it but also so that other people might understand why I love Vampire the Masquerade, and why I love the World of Darkness games, because they are so personal, they are so, I don't know, rich in their own way. And I hope if you've never played them, maybe you take a look at giving them a try. There are quick starts that are available for free, I believe, and uh, you could do a lot worse. So, one and all, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you come back for more videos, because I'll keep making more, and when my voice heals, I'll be making more proper Dungeon Tutor videos, and I hope you're looking forward to that. But until that time, my friends, I do hope, sincerely, that you get a chance to roll some dice, play some games, have some fun, but stay safe out there, my friends. Until that next time, farewell. <laughs>